start of that. So um, I think I did not uh, switch everything on. So it wasn't actually going live to all the different streams. So I'm starting again now. Reset, reset here. Welcome to Friday's lecture. Um, uh, great to see you. Hope your week went okay. And um, I'm starting off with some admin. Here's the uh, a little bit of admin. First of all, about using Piazza properly. Um, it's great. You got a lot of great activity there. Just keep remembering how to use it correctly. Don't um, uh, try not to ask questions that have already been asked. So search before you ask. And um, please remember how to use the private questions only for personal questions, like things that are to do with your personal health or your personal circumstances. All other questions should be um, should be public, and you don't po post code there. Um, next week we've got a lab test. Um, the details are on the course website. Uh, the first question is given to you already. It's you have to do hello world. Um, there's a how-to video on the course website that shows you how to step through that. So I expect everyone to get through that, okay? This lab test is not supposed to be difficult. Um, it's uh, the, the questions are, are of increasing difficulty, but they're all drawn from your homework. So if you've done the homework exercises, this is straightforward for you, okay? So you're gonna have to complete this lab test in your nominated lab time. If you can't make your nominated lab time, you'll have to forego the lab test. Not a big deal because it's redeemable, okay? So um, you should definitely try and make this lab test, but it is redeemable. And um, then you've got, uh, in terms of the labs more generally, you should have done lab one and two by now. And uh, in lab three, uh, your tutors, which is uh, in week four, lab three is in week four, don't forget um, your tutors will be looking at your journal and uh, be looking for engagement questions. Uh, someone says they've still got nothing. All right, it's not working properly. Um, I see, uh, Okay, let me just see here. Someone says it's not working properly. My things tell me I've got 10 people on YouTube and 80 people on Twitch. Um, all right, sorry for this interruption. All right, uh, Twitch is streaming well, says Harriet. Good on you, Harriet. Um, passing the lab test means you don't need to do the competency test in week four, spot on. Pascal, that's absolutely right. So the competency test is just to make sure that everyone in the class by the by week four has totally got familiar with the very basic tools. Um, and uh, I didn't mean to start a new thread there, that I should just hit reply, right? Um, the lab test, um, no, I don't believe the lab test in the VDI. I'm still negotiating the details of exactly how the lab test will run with the tech staff, but um, I think you'll be able to do it in your native environment. You will have to be able to screen share with your tutors, um, but um, I think you can do the whole thing in your native environment and you do have to do it in that time window allotted. Okay, it's only gonna be available to you in that specific time period. All right, uh, Steve, could you just delete the threads? I will try and delete the threads if I can delete the threads. Sorry, folks. Doing live coding lectures is challenging. Doing live coding lectures with all this uh, streaming and stuff. There we go. <laughs> all right, sorry, done. Okay, all right, now let's move on. Sorry for all that schmozzle there. Um, admin, um, assignment one. Okay, with a bit of luck, I'm gonna do a good job of this um, lecture. I'm gonna finish the main part of the lecture a bit early, and I'm gonna spend the last part of the lecture going through a whole lot of things with assignment one. So if you have questions about assignment one, get ready to ask them at the end of the lecture, which should be about mm, quarter two, quarter two of the hour. And from then on, I'll be doing assignment one. And what I'm, my plan is, unless you tell me there's something urgent that you want me to do differently, my plan is to go to task one, then task two, and so forth, and step through the tasks, and just talk through a little bit about what's involved, okay? So that's the plan. Um, and I'm I'm definitely not going to get to task 12 and 13. If you're courageous enough to try to th uh, 12 and 13, you're on your own. Um, it says MS Streams isn't working. Uh, Why isn't it working? Start event. Oh. Sorry, this dialogue says, don't forget to start your event. I told it to start it on the hour, um, but there's a pop-up saying I've got to start it. I've got to press the start button. Sorry, folks, Streams is up now. Um, the assignment is marked by CI. Um, and you need to, uh, um, so th so when you commit stuff and push it, the CI will run, and whatever that says is what you'll get marked on. So the last thing, continuous integration is a CI, you did it in lab one, um, 
CI is uh, in your labs. You do the CI, it runs and it tells you there's a little icon there. I think it's sort of a rocket ship and it says CI there. And we're using this for, for, for pretty well everything in this class. So you should be familiar with CI by now, folks. Everyone should be familiar with CI. It's how we do a, a lot of the grading in GitLab. Okay, so it's part of GitLab and it runs tests on a server. So when you push your work, GitLab will take your work, run a set of tests, and it will give you a pipeline telling you how that went. That's called the CI, and that will be marking your assignment, and uh, and um, so you need to be ready for that. Uh, make sure you complete your originality statement, um, and um, you have to do that correctly. Okay, you, if you don't complete it, you won't run the pipeline, so you get zero marks. Okay, um, and if you say something that's incorrect in there. That can lead to academic misconduct. I think I told you very clearly in the first class that in this class I take academic misconduct particularly seriously. Okay, so you need to think very, very carefully. Is what I say here exactly what I really did? So if you work with um, uh, someone else's code or something, you have to say that in the uh, in the originality statement. And if you don't say it in the originality statement, the consequences are very, very serious. Ultimately, it can mean that it says academic misconduct on your degree. So when you go get a job, it says academic misconduct and your employer can sort of say, well, maybe you can explain to me why it says academic misconduct on your on your degree. Okay, so you don't want, you really don't want to go down that, that, that route, okay? And I know some people get anxious at this point. They're thinking, oh, what, what happens if you, incur, you know, if you, um, if I get accused of academic misconduct and I'm actually innocent, don't stress, um, that doesn't happen. We have, ANU has extremely good, um, um, procedures for ensuring that anyone who has any reason to believe that they've been incorrectly um, accused of something, they have um, very good appeal systems. So you don't have to worry about that um, um, at, at all, okay? Um, this only affects a very, very small fraction of a class. But when you've got 450 students in the class, unfortunately, there's bound to be some people who'll do this. And unfortunately, some people in this class will probably end up with academic misconduct findings. It's due next Friday. Uh, the, all the details and times are on the website and there are no extensions in this class. Remember, no extensions. So if the dog ate your homework or whatever, there's no extension. Rather, you'll just have to put in, um, if, for this assignment, it's redeemable anyway. So, so you don't even need to put in a special consideration thing. But for later, ex later things, when um, you, if you miss the deadline, then you just need to put in a special consideration application to the university and explain why we need to treat your, space, your case specially and we absolutely will, right? So if you had to go to a hospital or uh, you had a um, some some other activity that was um, absolutely unavoidable, then we don't give you an extension. We just ask you to fill out the um, the special consideration form and, and we'll, we'll, we'll consider your case. All right, uh, what else have we got here? Any more questions on, no? Uh, what if you borrow ideas such as YouTube Java tutorial? Shall you declare it? You certainly shall. If you take material from anywhere else, you need to declare it. It's very, very, very clear. You go read the originality statement, okay? The golden rule is very simple. Do not misrepresent anyone else's work as your own. If you make it look like someone else's work is your work, then you're um, you're up for academic misconduct. Okay, so if you see a YouTube tutorial which tells you how to solve assignment one, you better declare that. If you don't declare that, then you're in really serious trouble. If you find a YouTube tutorial that sh shows you how to solve one particular part of the is the um, of something like the assignment, you should declare that as well. You need to declare that as well. Okay. So basically, if you've done something not just the lines of code, but the ideas behind the assignment. If the ideas have come from somewhere else, from your friend or whatever, you need to declare that, okay? Um, what does all rights reserved mean? That's a t copyright t uh, terminology. Um, so they reserve the right to, um, to fo well, I'm not sure the context of that question. Um, commit and push. You no, know, you don't need to contact a tutor. The whole thing's automatic. So all you need to do is push your assignment, okay? You just push it by the deadline. And I strongly recommend you push it well before the deadline. Push it multiple times, okay? Make sure everything's good. What you do not want to do is five minutes before the deadline, find out that uh, you're failing the CI because you didn't, you couldn't work out how to fill in the um, contribution statement, or the originality statement correctly. Okay, that'd be a great pity because then you get zero for the assignment just because you typed the originality statement wrong, all right? So this is why you do it well in advance and you keep, submitting it, keep pushing it, and make sure all those details are, are worked out well in advance. Okay. Um, will we get marks if we, if we use another source to help with the assignment? What happens is you're getting judged um, on your contribution, okay? So we're trying to assess you on a particular thing. Now, if we think a significant amount of what you've delivered in the assignment has come from another source because that's what you said, then yes. So according to our rules, you can copy the assignment from your friend, declare it in the assignment, in the thing, and it says, you know, I got all this work from my friend, Mary. Um, 
And that's fine, okay? Absolutely fine. But obviously you get no marks for it because there's no original contribution from you. So you're gonna get assessed according to your original contribution. If you went and learned something online about how to solve a particular sort of problem, um, that's fine. We encourage that a lot, but you should still declare it. And you're very unlikely to lose marks if you just learn how to do something very interesting online, okay? But you should always declare it, okay? Always declare what you've done. And, you, and, and you're not gonna lose marks unless essentially someone has helped you solve the assignment. If someone has helped you solve the assignment, or you found a solution to the assignment, then obviously you'll lose marks, but you won't be punished. You're just going to lose marks, okay? You won't get academic misconduct or anything like that as long as you declare it, okay? Previously in knowledge from the past, you don't need to declare that, no. Um, it reminds me of an Oscar Wilde quote. All I have to declare is my intelligence, I think it was, is what it was. Can you import modules? Of course you can import modules. You can import anything you like. However, it has to pass CI. So if you import something weird that's only on your computer, it won't pass CI and then you'll fail, okay? I mean, you'll fail the CI, right? And, uh, yep. All right, someone said they came in late. They've missed it. Um, yeah, everything's recorded. Oh, okay, this is a good time for me to jump to the course webpage and show you how everything is on the course webpage. Let's go there. Okay, so if you want to go and see um, what about codes we wrote ourselves that were submitted to a previous assignment, that's fine. That's uh, that, that's fine. If, if it's yours, remember that I said the golden rule was that don't misrepresent someone else's work as your own. Okay. So if it's your own work and you did it in the past, it's just no problem at all. But if it's someone else's work, then you've got a real problem because you're misrepresenting. When you submit that stuff, the, the statement you're writing says, this is my own work. And if that's not true, then there's a big problem. Okay. So your statement says, this is my own work with the following exceptions. Okay, and if the exception is the whole assignment came from my friend, Fred, my friend Fred, well, that's okay. You're not going to get academic misconduct, but you're going to get zero because it means none of the of the, the key work we're assessing on actually was yours. So you haven't lied, you haven't broken any rules, but you haven't really done anything either. Okay, so the, in that case, you get zero. That's a bit of, bit of a silly example. But if you just took a tiny part from someone else um, and you said that, you might lose you know half of one mark or something according to how much you took, right? As long as you actually said that you did that. All right. Now, uh, I want to show you something on the course webpage. Uh, if you click on these things here, it jumps you to the um, the, or the, the, the the units in the lecture. And you see here, um, you know, like J7. And if you click here, that's the course video. and It'll jump to the point in the video where J7 was, right? So there it is. And that's just linking you through to YouTube and you're watching it on YouTube and that's unit J7. Everything's organized like that. And if you want to just watch the whole lectures from start to finish, if you really want to do that, you can go and watch them here. But they're all broken down by unit here. So you can say, if you can't remember how to do a switch statement, you could um, look here, um, control flow, um, break and so forth here, switch, you go to switch and you could jump here and see switches there. So you could jump into this lecture here and find all about, all about how to do a switch statement. Okay, so that's, it's important you know how to use that. I, I go to trouble to make this website really accessible to you so that you can um, get all the learning material uh, at your fingertips. Um, it's there for you to use now. Um, and so I encourage you to use it. All right. Uh, what's the bumping bands question? What was the question? Um, the file originally.yaml is in the, in the project directory and also Folks, on the website, let me go back to the website. There's a thing here. Some people are stressed out about how to fill this out. There's a whole whole guideline on how to do that here on the help uh, page. Why do we need to fill it out? And, uh, and so forth. And how does it all work? And how do you use YAML? It's all here, okay? How do I fill out the original originality statement correctly? Okay? So read this stuff. It explains, it answers a lot of your questions here. Um, Jack says he's bumping Ben's question about simple syntax sources. I don't even know what that, that question means. Sorry, um, maybe you can rephrase. But um, where what we're interested in, um, Jack and Ben, is we're interested in you solving the problems in the assignment and uh, not re misrepresenting your work as someone else's. Uh, where you learnt syntax. You don't have to, you're hopefully not learning syntax. If you're learning an idea, like um, how to, um, how to solve a search problem like the one in assignment one. If you're learning that idea, yeah, you want to cite that. If you're learning what a for loop is, yeah, that was in the lectures, so you shouldn't need to be citing anything, okay? If it's the sort of thing that's directly in the lectures, of course, you don't need to cite anything that I taught you. You don't need to say, well, you taught me this on, on Monday, you taught me that on Tuesday, right? That obviously doesn't need to be cited. If, if it's something at that level, of course, you don't need to cite it. We're interested in here is ideas, okay? Not syntax. This course is not about syntax. It's about ideas. 
All right, um, let's move on now. Uh, this next unit is one of the most important units. Um, why is it important? It's because it's about objects. This course has object orientation as a key part of the course. It's also something that many students trip up on. So I really want to um, help you uh, work through this. Um, and I really want you to try and pay attention and feel free to ask questions because there's some very, very key ideas here. And unfortunately, those of you who have not done object oriented language before will often find it very hard to um, to grasp um, these issues, uh, these ideas, but hopefully you won't. Okay, let's anyway, let's step into it. Right, um, three different types of um, variable. We've got local variables, global variables, and heap variables. And I've already introduced you to these before, but I'm going to go through it one more time. Okay, a local variable is declared within the scope of a method, and they hold temporary state, and they disappear once the method returns. Now you've seen that repeatedly in the examples I've given in the past lectures, and you've seen it. On the, um, on the on the Waterloo Visualizer, and if you looked at the Waterloo Visualizer, you would have seen that they showed up in frames. Okay, there was a frame, and it had a value x. The frame is what we call the stack. It's a it's a frame on the stack, and that is what we call a local variable. And when the method is return when you return from the method, that x goes away. Okay, a global variable is um, also known as a class variable, and in Java um, we use the static qualifier to identify these. Okay, so they're declared a, a frame is um, I showed you a frame in the Waterloo Visualizer. Um, you don't really need to know what that is, um, but I'm just saying that's a terminology that they use in the Waterloo Visualizer. I'll just see if I can quickly show you an example here. Um, but you need to have watched previous lectures. If you haven't been wat watching the lectures, you won't. Um, this won't make any sense to you. So um, I'm, I'm assuming that you've done that. So if you visualize the execution here, this is some random piece of code. I just, there we go, frames. Okay, someone asked what that is. Um, Difficult to be 100% clear about academic integrity. No, it's not difficult, folks. All you need to do is not misrepresent someone else's work as your own. It's as simple as that, okay? So it's really not difficult. Um, if you refer to a textbook, no, you're learning that from a textbook, okay? But if someone taught you how to solve the assignment, that's mis that's academic misconduct unless you um, report that, okay? This really isn't so, um, so, so hard, okay? This really isn't hard. Um, it's common sense. I mean, I don't, I don't want to make a big deal of it, but what the problem is, I often get students saying, well, you know, my friend here told me how to solve half the assignment, but I didn't realize that was wrong. For most of you, this is completely obvious, um, but I have to spell it out because people will later on say, well, you didn't tell us that wasn't right. So um, that's why I'm spelling it out. So please, I know you're asking these questions like it's difficult to be 100% clear about academic integrity. It's difficult to be clear about whether someone's lying to you or not, right? these things in life can be difficult, but really the, it's not a very difficult problem to solve. Are you misrepresenting someone else's work as your own? That's all you need to answer. And if, if you can answer that with a, with a straight face and say, no, you're not, then you're all good and you can forget about this whole thing. But make sure you fill out the form correctly. So if someone did help you with part of the assignment or you did find a solution to part of the assignment, you just say where you found it, okay? And if you're doing the advanced parts of the assignment, which are really tricky, um, and someone you found on the web a really good way of solving it, you need to refer to that, okay? But for, for how to do a for loop, no, I teach you that in lectures. You don't need to cite that, all right? Let's get on with it, folks. Um, someone asked what a frame is. Frames are here, and you, you see here you've got a variable i there, and you see this local variable i is going to be on that frame, okay? It's not a heap variable, that's all, okay? All right. All right, someone says, um, uh, asked about uh, an upstream pool. Um, it's unfortunate that the 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 the, the um, when you do when you do the CI uh, we use the word integrity. We're talking about the integrity of your repo, not whether your the, not your integrity, the integrity of the repo. If your repo is out of date, then uh, you will fail CI. Yet yeah, you need to pass CI, otherwise you get zero marks. Okay. Very simple. If you're not passing CI, you get zero marks. All right. So if it says there you need to do an upstream pull, then you better do that upstream pull. Okay. Otherwise, you're going to get zero. Okay. So that's why I said to you earlier, you need to make sure you push regularly and make sure you're passing CI. If you're not passing CI, that's a big deal because CI is what you get marked on. This is auto graded. Okay. You will have a tutor also look at your assignment, but um, the CI is there to tell you, hey, you haven't updated your, your assignments out of date. You better fix it. If you don't do that and you don't pay attention to what the CI says, then that's a problem. Okay. All right. Global variables. Um, the, the, the next two parts of the parts I really want to emphasize what a class variable is and what an instance variable is. A class variable is um, they're declared in a class and they exist as long as the class is loaded, but they're a property of the class, not a property of the instance. Think to the example of the bicycle. 
I gave you an example of what might be a class variable. That is, it's a, it's a property of the type of bicycle rather than of the particular bicycle. Can anyone on um, the chat give me a suggestion as to what might be a um, a good global variable for a bicycle? For the so it's it's a class variable. What would be a class variable for a bicycle? Anyone? I gave you I gave you examples already, right? So these are these are variables that describe properties of every bike of this type. Okay, every bike of this type because they belong to the class, not to the particular bike, but to the class of bicycles. So I've got a particular brand of bike. There's a variable there, and someone says, um, "What do we got here? Number of bikes? Yeah, you could have that, like the number of bikes sold, right? So um, you could have a string giant TCR, which would be the the string which describes the name of the bike. So that could be a name field for the global, right? That's a good example. Someone says the number of bikes sold, uh, the number of bikes sold. So like so far we've sold 10,532 of this kind of bike. That would be a global variable, which is a part associated with the model. Color, probably not, because probably for most models of bike, you have multiple colors. It's more likely to be a variable that's associated with a particular bike. So I want this model of bike, but I want it in red. I want this model of bike, but I want it in blue. Okay, uh, number of gears, that's a good example. That's usually something that's part of the model. So I'll buy this model of bike and it's got 12 gears. I'll buy this model of bike, it's got 18 gears or it's got one gear. Okay, so that's a property of that type of bike. That's a global variable. It's a property of the type of bike. Okay, um, I am using the wrong mouse here. Whoops, where are we? Sorry, folks. Um, style, yeah, you can, yeah, it's a it's a recumbent or whatever. So a color, a color, yeah, someone says, wouldn't it be part of the constructor? That is, this particular bike is going to be red. This particular bike will be blue. That's exactly right. So let's go to the next part. What's an instance variable? It's a property of this particular bike, not of all bikes, but of particular bikes. Anyone got suggestions? Suggestions about, about instance variables, okay, for a bike. Okay, the serial number, exactly. That's the canonical example, right? Because every single bike should have a different serial number. You turn the bike upside down, look at the bottom of the frame, and there might be a number there, and that will be the serial number. And every one of your bikes will have a different number on it. So that's an instance variable associated with a particular bike, okay? Um, the gear number that you're currently in, right? So right now I'm in, in first gear on my bike, but you might be in sixth gear, and you have, may have the same model of bike, but your bike is, is a different bike. So we're in different bikes, okay? And uh, Harriet says, color, yeah, absolutely. You might have a red bike, and I have a blue bike, or whatever it might be. And um, any others? Yeah, so they're really good examples. If you understood what we just discussed there and what the people said in the chat, then you're really getting the ideas between a global variable, which is associated with the type, i.e. the class of bicycle, and a heap variable, which is associated with this particular one. And you need to understand this idea deeply. It's a very, very deep and pervasive idea and everything to do with object-oriented programming, okay? The difference between the instance bike, that's yours, and the class of bike, that is the kind of bike which has a catalog associated with it and um, and has a, a description which describes what characteristics this kind of bike has. All right, yeah, frame size, that's a good, a good example too. So you might buy this kind of bike and I buy a small one and you buy a big one or whatever it might be and uh, you buy one with so many centimeter frame or this many, many centimeter frame, they're properties of that particular bike but the model of bike may be the same model of bike. All right, next, garbage collection, very serious stuff here. Um, so a question for the chat, why, why is garbage collection so important? Anyone know on chat, why is garbage collection so important? Why, why do I want to emphasize garbage collection? Um, serious, uh, more seriously, uh, that, that was a joke question, but no one's answered yet. Um, the, the, uh, the memory management, yes it is. Um, someone asked what a static qualifier, yeah, stop memory leaks, yeah. No, the real reason is because uh, that's my field of expertise. I'm very well known for garbage collection. <laughs> If you go look on my webpage, you'll find a whole bunch of exciting papers about garbage collection. That's the reason why I say garbage collection is so important. Um, and that's what I was doing when I, I told you earlier I was working at Google. I was helping them improve the garbage collective for Chrome. Um, and uh, me and one of my PhD students today, and you are still working on that right now. Um, so what does a static qualifier mean? Going back to the previous question, it is hard doing this asynchronously, but um, let me, uh, wrong mouse, there we are. Sorry. Uh, static qualifier that just means it has the word static in front of the variable that's what the static means okay so if uh, unfortunately in java it doesn't have a qualifier for instance variable so if it's got no qualifier it means it's instance if it's got static it means it's global okay um garbage collection what garbage collection is about is about automatically reclaiming memory and the alternative to to um doing it automatically is for it to be done manually 
Okay. And the problem with doing it manually is you have to keep track of what you've allocated and what you might use in the future. Okay. You have to keep track of what you've already allocated and what you might use in the future. And this is actually a surprisingly complex task. Um, so in many languages like C and C++, they do not have garbage collectors and you actually have to do this. So when you allocate an object here, I've got to remember that I allocated in some time in the future, I've got to go and explicitly delete it. This is error prone and it's actually one of the major source of security bugs. Uh, I think uh, Microsoft or Google released a study saying it's the number one source of security bugs in their software. Okay, um, and uh, garbage collection solves this problem. Uh, and and the and the the, 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 the the two kinds of bugs you can have. Can anyone guess on the chat what someone's already said something? There, someone's already kind of answered it. Um, it's not like delete in C++. Delete is what I was just saying before, where you actually have to do it explicitly. Okay, delete in C++ means I know that I don't need this anymore, and um, I'm going to explicitly delete it. Garbage collection figures it out for you, so you don't have to try and figure out when to delete it and when not to delete it. Okay, because figuring that out is very, very problematic and is one of the major source of errors in software today. And um, so what are the two errors? Someone already wrote one answer up there. Um, and the, the error uh, it was Ben, he says, memory leaks, absolutely. So if I forget, if I forget to, to delete the object, right, then ultimately I can have objects piling up and piling up and piling up and it's using up all of my resources. Okay, so it's using up all my memory, which is bad. Okay, so we don't want that. So that's a very important class of bug that you get if you don't have garbage collection. Okay, um, you get memory leaks. The other source of bug is, is, is much worse than that. Does anyone know what the other source of bug is? Um, it's what we call use after free. So I free it and then subsequently use it because I freed it too early. Okay, so a memory leak, a memory leak um, is where you um, forget to free it. Um, uh, a use after free error is where you free it too early okay you free something too early and um then you go and use the thing that you thought was an object and it's gone and that actually is a secure uh, very serious security issue it's one of the major sources of security bugs today um and someone says can it still be beneficial to do man manual memory management well there's a cost associated with garbage collection and so um uh, we try to, um, so there are some situations where it's deemed to be uh, worth not doing it. That, and there are also programming languages, which, which help more, more modern programming languages, which help us. We're not going to talk about it here, but um, yeah, you can change uh, something that's not yours. That's exactly right. And that's why you can crash a program. Um, there are languages like Rust. Rust is a really interesting programming language. And what Rust does is it uses some very clever compiler techniques for us to know whether something still could be used. Um, and um, it uh, has very strict rules, which basically make you think ahead of time about when things are going to be used. And it's completely safe in this respect. Okay, now does garbage collection solve all the problems? Well, not really, because the way garbage collection works is it collects based on what it can reach. So if, if there's an object here and there's still a pointer to it, still a reference to it, then the garbage collector will say, well, you know, you might use that in the future. Okay, so if you still retain pointers to things that you're actually not using, then it will keep them around. Okay, so you can still have memory leaks with, even with garbage collector collectors. However, memory leaks with garbage collectors tend to be much less of a problem than with manually uh, memory manage, manual memory management where uh, the programmer has to do it all in their head. Doing it all in your head is becomes is easy enough with a very tiny little program, but doing it with a million lines of code is extremely difficult. Okay, so enough about garbage collection. Um, it is an important subject. G J Java is a garbage collected language. Most object oriented languages are, are garbage collected. JavaScript, which is what runs inside Chrome, that's garbage collected. So garbage coll collection is a very important idea. The key things you need to remember are that it is the alternative to doing things manually. Doing things manually is problematic and is a very major source of security error. That's why people prefer to use garbage collection. Garbage collection doesn't come for free because the garbage collector has to go and figure out what's what's still live and what's not live, and that takes work. Okay, so there's some work associated with it. All right, uh, next. Another very important lesson from today's class, lots of important lessons in today's class, the this keyword, okay? So if I've got some code and it's a code that for the instance, it's instance, um, it's it's an instance method. How do I know it's an instance method? Well, it's an instance method if it doesn't have the static qualifier in the method. It, that means it's an instance method. If it's an instance method, it needs to refer to this. And I showed you previously with the, with the Java Waterloo Visualizer, the this the, the, there is this notion that you're pointing to a particular object whenever you're using an instance method. It's not explicit in Java, 
but it's implicit in Java, this idea of this, and it means the object we're talking about right now. Sometimes it's useful to use that keyword to say, yeah, I really mean this object, okay? You do that uh, frequently when you get a parameter which has the name foo, and I also have a field name foo, okay? T two things with the same name. I can differentiate it by saying this.foo, for the one that's part of the object and just foo for the parameter. Okay, so I've got two variables with the same name. They're both foo and one is an instance field and the other one is a parameter. And I can explicitly refer to the instance field by saying this dot foo. So this is the name of an object. It's automatically always the name of the object against which this method is currently running. Okay, you're gonna see this a lot in the f in, as we move along. So this should become more and more familiar to you soon enough. Okay, um, slide question. Do garbage collectors check only after X lines of code have been run? So um, it's a very good question. Uh, the answer is complicated. Um, it depends on what's going on um, as to how frequently they run. And uh, this is a very open question and it depends a lot on the particular application domain, who's using them, what responsiveness they need and so forth and so on. So great question, complicated answer. Um, but it, and it will vary depending on uh, how you configure your virtual machine. So even with Java, there are very many different answers to that question and you can change that at the command line as to exactly how it behaves. I could talk to you for weeks on that, <laughs> on that one question. It's a good question but way beyond the, the this course here um <clears throat> disambiguating field names from parameters i just said that and calling other constructors um when there are multiple constructors you can use this to refer to another constructor so when i write constructors for my class i can give them parameters and i can have simple ones and complicated ones and sometimes i'll express the complicated ones in terms of the simple ones. And if I want to call the constructor of my uh, inside my own um, type, I can say this and the parameters and that will, instead of having a method name, it just says this, and that's implicitly calling the constructor. You may see that um, in examples in the future. Don't stress too much if you don't quite follow me yet. Access control, I told you before we have in Java has this very strong notion of access control. The reason for this is simple. It's a principle, it's a very strong principle that we want information Someone asked if a constructor means a function. A constructor is a very special function that's called exactly once for each object. It's called when the when the object's created. It's basically the initializer. Okay, that's that's what the constructor is. It's a special kind of function. Uh, access modifiers determine whether fields and methods may be accessed by other classes. Okay, so we've got these in Java. We've got these. Um, uh, four levels and one of them has nothing. One is the no modify ones, like a, it's a default. So there's, you don't, if you don't write anything, you get that. Okay, so you get public, which means that everyone can see it. Protected means um, that the package and subclass of this thing can see it. And then private means only things in this class can see it, okay? And we've got a principle that says, um, uh, we've got a, we've got a principle that says that we always want to keep things as private as possible. Okay, and I explained to you in a previous lecture why that is, and the basic idea is we want to keep things private because the more information we make visible, the more complicated things get. That's basically the reason, the intuition behind it. So it's as a rule of thumb, keep things as private as possible, expose as little as possible. It keeps the software simpler. And the analogy I gave you earlier is that when you jump on an airplane, you don't need to know exactly how the jet engine works. That's abstracted away. You just trust that it works somehow, okay? You don't need to go and pass a test that you understand how a jet engine works to get on a plane. That's unnecessary information for the task you have at hand, which is getting on the plane. Okay, but in principle, someone needs to know how that works, right? But it's not you who needs to know that. And same with software, with very, very complex software. We don't want to have to know exactly how every single part of the software works. We just want to know that it's reliably going to do what it says it's going to do, not exactly how it's going to do it. Um, in the homework problems, it tells us to write public classes. Yeah, that's a very good point. Do you know why that is? That's because of the way our tests work, okay? That's a very good point. Um, um, we prefer to write everything as privately as we can, but often we need to use public in our testing environment in the class because of the way the tests work. So um, forgive us for that. That's a very good point. Um, What's the difference between a function in Python and a method in Java? Not a lot, they're very similar. Um, we could go into detail about how they differ, but they're, they're broadly the same idea. Um, uh, yeah, someone, Katrina asks, uh, is this relevant to the error that non-static method cannot be referenced from a static context? Absolutely, you're absolutely right. So, and I answered this on Piazza last night or yesterday, someone asked this exact question. And uh, the, the question is if, I'm in a static context, I don't have a this, I'm not operating on an object, I'm operating on the class. If I then go and call a method, 
um, without using uh, without referring to a particular object and that method is an instance object the question is what object do you want to do this on right if it's an instance method you need to say which object it is so i can't just go and call from a static method a an instance method okay unless i specify which object the instance method is going to operate on because instance methods must operate on some object now if i'm already in an instance method and i call another instance method it will implicitly be the same object on which it's called. So I don't need to specify which object it is. But if I'm in a static method and I want to call a instance method, I need to say which object I want to call it against, okay? Yep. Um, and, and and by the way, this stuff here is more about style. It's not about um, the, the code will still compile or whatever. Um, when I say you keep things as private as possible, that's a stylistic thing, okay? It's not a requirement, all right? Class and instance members. The static keyword identifies class variables, class methods, and constants. So it says these belong to the class. And we, we went through these examples before with the bicycle about what might be a class one and what might be an instance one. Okay, a class variable is common to all objects. So this variable, all objects share this one thing. So the, the number of bikes sold, all members of that particular type can access that one field. But there's only one field that says for this type of bike, here's the number that was sold. So it's common. All of them see that same value. A class method is a method that's invoked on the class name, not on the particular object. And an, an example might be, give me the PDF for the brochure for this for this type of bike. Okay, so it's a method um, that, that that is relevant to this type of bike. Okay, so whenever, I mean, if I'm in a, uh, a method for a particular bike and I call that one, I'm getting the same method as every other bike. We're all calling the same one. It's a class method. And a constant, you can declare a constant by, um, by, making, by calling it static. Um, and you have to use the final modifier as well. Uh, initializer, we have initializers for both static and um, objects. Uh, for objects, the initializers are what we call constructors. We already discussed them before. Now, you can also have initializers for, for um, static initializers. And all you need to do is write a block of code with the curly braces and put the word static in front. And then that behaves very much like a constructor does for an object. It does for a class. And that code will be run whenever the class is created. And the class normally only gets created once when you run a program. So you can write a block of code with curly braces and just put the word static in front. And that will automatically be run at the beginning. Okay, enum types. Enum types, you, if you've looked at the assignment, you will have already seen some enum types. An enumerated type is a special kind of class. Um, and it's defined with an enum keyword rather than the class keyword. And a variable of an enum type must be one of a set of predefined values. I jumped ahead to in the last lecture to give you a heads up on this. Um, we use them for defining non-numerical sets such as north, south, east, west, right? There's, there's only those four points to the compass and um, the, the grades, for example, there. And Java enums can have other fields. Before I go any further, does any, can anyone suggest other enum types that you might use in coding? Can, what's, a, what's another example of something that's well-defined like that? Um, you know, can anyone think of another thing that we might want to uh, use an enum to describe? Something that is has a fixed set that we often uh, boolean. Yeah, we, we, yeah, the boolean's a good example, right? Because it's got true and false. However, we've already got a boolean type, so we don't need to make an enum for booleans. So colors, yeah, we, yeah. I mean, if you had the primary colors, maybe because the primary colors are well well defined. Colors in general are not. There's a huge suite of them, so you might have a fixed set like the primary colors, right? That's an example. And someone else says capital cities. Yeah, maybe even they can state the states. Maybe you know what's a good example? Yeah, the seasons is a good example. The directions we've already done. Another one's a uh, mathematical constant. That's not really an enum. That's more like a constant. We can use constants for that. Time of day, maybe, but you know what? A better example is the days of the week, right? We have those, and then they're not likely to change anytime soon. Um, a date is a variable, right? So we, that's not a good example. But a day of the week is um, suits enum, so you could have um, each of the days of the week as, as part of an enum. All right, let's move on um, and do the mini quiz. There is a mini quiz here. I've just published it. You should be able to see the mini quiz now. Um, and then I'm going to start doing some coding. And if I get this coding done quickly, that took me a lot longer than I hoped. So I'll tell you what I do. Well, I'll do folks. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, if I, um, run out of time here, what I might do is go on and, um, in the recording, continue and say a little bit about the assignment. And if you're, uh, if you're, um, um, or, or maybe I'll add it to the recording so you can add, watch the recording. Okay, so if I run out of time, don't panic. I'll still do some stuff in the assignment. Okay, All right. Let's get on and write some code. New Java class. It's going to be um, 02 um, 
002, yep. Oops, goodness me, keyboard issues here. 002 dot um, person. Okay, we're going to create a type called person. Do you want to add it to get? Yep. And what, what I'm going to do here is be lazy and steal the body of it out of here. So here, just grab all this stuff here. We created this person type in the last lecture. And I'm just going to add that type here. There it is. Save a bit of time instead of typing all that stuff out. So here we've got a person. Okay, so we've got an instance field, which is their age. We've got another instance field, which is their name. We've got a constructor here, right? Notice the constructor's got no return type. We covered constructors in the last lecture. People are asking about um, planets is a good example, um, by the way, Vanina. Um, we've got a constructor here for a person, and we pass in their age and their string. Notice we're using the this keyword here, this dot age that says that makes sure we're referring to the instance field age here. And this age here is the parameter. So it says make the instance field age be equal to our parameter age. Okay, so when you create an object, it takes this value and puts it in the field of the object. Okay, and then here we've got a main method and we've created two people. We've created Mary and we've, oops, notice something interesting here. I've, um, when I cut and paste, it automatically used the code from last lecture and it wrote in there 01, which is last lecture's code. We don't want that. We want to use this lecture's code. And normally you don't cut and paste like I've been doing. It's kind of wicked, but I'm doing it uh, as a matter of expediency in a lecture. Um, there we are. Oops. All right, so I just got rid of a bunch of stuff there, which is dragged over from the fact that it was in, in this, this package over here. Okay, so we've created a person Mary, declared person Mary, and we've created it there. We've declared person Fred, and we've got their name wrong. Better fix that. Um, we declared a person there. And then we've printed these things out. Okay, we can run this. Oh, let's run that, make sure it's all happy. Run the person. Okay, there it is. And uh, we've got this two string method here. I explained that in the last lecture and that's overriding the one that's in Java Lang object. And you can see this thing gets printed out. Now what we wanna do is we, we want to do some basic inheritance. I explained inheritance to you before um, and now we're gonna actually implement some very basic inheritance. And what inheritance allows us to do is to define another type, which is like the one we have here um, only it um, um, is more specific, okay? So inheritance is about being more specific. So we're gonna say a new, um, we're gonna create a, a main method here. Uh, let's do this here, new Java, oops, that's not what I want to do. New Java class here, new Java class, we're gonna call it inheritance. So we're gonna do the, did I spell it right? Inher, no, I left out the H. Um, Inheritance. Okay, so we're going to create a class here and we'll add it to git. And I'm actually going to, again, cut and paste. Very wicked. I'm just going to cut and paste that main method there. And it's going to do the same stuff. So this is very boring. It's not doing anything interesting yet. We're going to do something interesting in a moment. Okay, so this class here does nothing but create a person object, this person here, another person object, and then print out information about those people. So let's just run this. Uh, run inheritance.main and it'll just behave the same as we did over here. There it is there. Okay, nothing interesting yet. Okay, we'll come back to that in a moment. Now what I'm gonna do is we're gonna create a new class, a new type, right? Remember, we can have a type called object, which is the top of the Java um, type hierarchy. And we've got a very specific model of bicycle down here. And we can have things in between, right? We can have a thing called um, an object. We can have another thing called a bicycle. And then we can have another thing here, which is your exact brand of bike. Like uh, someone mentioned there, a giant, such and such, right? That's a very specific one. So in between, you've got different levels of abstraction. So a person is a very general one. Let's create a new type here, which we're gonna call student, okay? Student is a specific kind of person. And when I while I'm doing this, can someone try and think of something that a student has that a typical person doesn't have, right? Something, an attribute that we're gonna associate with a student. Student, what attribute do we wanna associate with a student, an A new student, let's just call them that. Okay, so a student, what attribute do we wanna associate with a student? Um, any comments there? Student ID, perfect. Well done, Darren. Okay, so we're gonna give them a student ID. That's one thing we're gonna do. So but what we're gonna do is we're gonna say the student extends a person, person. Okay, so that means that this student here is going to extend, oops, wrong keyboard issues here still, um, the person. Now it says here, uh, oops, it, there's no default constructor. Come on, where's the light bulb? There we go. We bring the light bulb up and it creates a constructor for us. Okay, now, did you notice there's a red line there? And it says you haven't made the constructor. We need a constructor to match the constructor we get for the person. Okay, and um, it says you may want to construct it like this. 
And notice what this is doing. It's making the construct of a student be just the same as one for a person. Then notice what it does. It calls this thing called super, which means call the constructor for person because that's our super class. What we're going to do here is we're going to add a, um, a UID. We'll make it a string because um, UIDs often have a letter at the start. So string UID like that. Okay. And then what we'll do is the student uh, constructor can also, in addition to the name and the age, take in the UID, right? And then what we can do is we can say, for the name and the age, just pass it on to our parent, our parent type, which is person. And for the uh, UID, we'll say this dot UID equals UID. Okay. So that means we've created a new student object and it's got a name and an age and a student ID as well. Okay. And then um, we can create, we've noticed I made that UID private and we can make an accessor method. So if someone can, get, can see this public, right? And say, get, um, get UID. It's going to do the code for us. Yeah. So IntelliJ just wrote that, all that code for me because it figured out that I wanted to, it's very common in, in Java and other languages to use what we call getter and setter methods. So as soon as I wrote get, it said, oh, okay, you want to get this thing. So it went and filled in all that code for us automatically. Um, and then we want to do our own two string method because remember, it's very useful to um, do a two string method. Um, so let's do that. And we're going to override our parent one. And so what should we do? Um, override um, string um, public. It has to be public like our parent. String to string like that. And um, we're going to return a string, but we don't want to go through all the, look, let's have a look at what it did we did for, for person here. We're going to return the name and we say their age and then whatever, right? So we don't want to, we can type all that again, but let's not do that. Let's not type it all again. Rather, let's call our parents to string method to get all that stuff. So we get a string from our parent, which has got all that stuff in it. And how, we, how do we do that? How do we, how do we call our parents to string method? Well, we use a special keyword called super, which means go to our parent and call the to string method. Okay. So that's gotten the string that our parent produced, which was, which was this. Okay. And now we want to add to that something specific to the student. And what do we add? Well, we can add the, uh, the UID. So we can write some little text here. We can say comma has a uh, UID and then um, add the uh, concatenate on the UID like that. Okay. Once we've done that, we can now go back to our inheritance example here and we can change um, Mary into being a student. Okay. So we can change that from being a person to being a student like that. And we can, um, Mary's confused about her name as well. All right. And then we can say, um, uh, give them a UID like you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Like that. Now we run our pro. Oops. What happened there? Sorry, keyboard issues again. All right, so now we run this program now and we should find that we, instead of creating a person, we've created a student and we see Mary is age 19 and has this UID. All right, now someone asking me new questions here. The parent class is a class above the current class in the hierarchy. Yeah, yep, yep. We've added information. Overrides just a keyword which tells that we've actually changed the behavior of our from our parent. Our parents already got this behavior, but we're changing it. That's what the override's doing. Great, great question answering. Um, yeah, so there's already a two string method here in person. Not only that, but there's also a two string method. If you go here, this is really useful. Look, folks, if you can spot that little thing there, this is telling us exactly that. That tells us that person's parent, what's the parent of person? The parent of person is object because everything inherits from object. So we go to like this, I mean, see, it's got its own two string method. There we are. We're in object and it's got its own two string method. If we go back to person, where are we? Person. Um, it says also there's a subclass with a two string method and there's only one of them and it's uh, this one here. Okay. So that's telling us who's overriding, changing the behavior of the two string method. IntelliJ is helping us do that. All right. Now we've done that. So we've done one level inheritance. I want to go a step further before we finish the lecture and um, go uh, and create a new type here called a comp 1110 student. So we've gone from a person to something more specific, which is a student. Now we're going to get really specific and have a comp 1110 student. Okay. So a new Java class, um, comp 1110 student, right? and um, add, what could we add for the comp 1110 student, right? We're going to say that they extend student. Okay. So they're going to have a UID and an age and a name. What can we have for the comp 11? Oops. All right. That's got to be capitalized, right? Student. There it is. Okay. So it extends that. 
Okay, so it means it's more specific than that. Okay, and then they've got this little red light bulb here, and we go to here and it says, uh, do we want to create a constructor? Yeah, we do. So it's gone and made a constructor for us. All right. Now, what can we add to a student? Let's see what people said. Uh, lab group, lab day. Yeah, they're good. I'm not going to do that though. They're good suggestions. They're very good suggestions. Um, but what I'm going to do is add stuff that's specific to Comp 11 10. That's the marks. You guys care about marks. So let's just add that. And because I am short on time and I'm being lazy, I've actually gone and done this for you already because you don't want to see me type all this crap. Um, copy and um, paste. There we are. And we're going to change that. Instead of doing that simple constructor, we're going to do this. Bang. Okay. So now what we have is the two assignments, uh, the class engagement, the lab test, the mid-semester exam, the exam. And we've got a constructor here, which takes in all that stuff there and calls um, the name and the age. All right. Oh, I've got them the wrong way around. It doesn't really matter. Okay. So it's got red squiggly lines. That's because when I wrote the code for this version, age, my name, we reverse the order. It really doesn't matter, but you have to be consistent, right? So it's expecting to have a string followed by an int, I guess. Where was it? Let's have a look here. Um, uh, yeah, it's expecting to have an int followed by a string and we were doing the other way around. So it's complaining, all right? And to be consistent, we can change this as well. Otherwise we're gonna get confused. I'll get confused anyway. All right, so there we are like that, okay? All right, all good. So I've just switched them around. And all this has done is made us a constructor, which makes a new Comp 1110 student and sets up all their marks, okay? As simple as that. Now what we want to do is we want to write a, a um, toString method for that. So let's do that. So um, say at override toString. It's filling it all out for us. Oh my goodness, that's pretty good. ToString, whoa, it's done all that. We don't want to do all that. That's IntelliJ just filling all that stuff in for us. We don't want to actually do all that. That's a bit horrible. Um, thank you, IntelliJ. Very nice thought, but no. Um, so what we're going to do instead is we're going to say super dot two string, right? And um, and then we're going to add some stuff that's specific to Comp 1110. And um, what we'd really like to do, and we're not going to do it just yet, is we're going to, we'll, we'll get this person's mark. So how do we calculate the mark? So we're doing two things here. We're going to write some. Oops. We're going to do two. Oh man, keyboard issues. Um, we're going to do two things here. We're going to work out how to write a method. On this class for this instance is an instance method it's for this particular student we're going to do that and also um but you're going to understand better how your marks will actually work for this class all right so um what is the how do we calculate a mark for a comp 11 10 student let's write ourselves a little method here um private int mark right that's going to be this student's mark and um we're going to uh put the stuff in here and we're going to return what we really want here is a special in our class with this special idea of redeeming marks and a redeemed mark means that we get the better of either the mark you got for this thing or the mark you got in your final exam remember so let's also write ourselves a redeem method private overt int redeem and we're going to take in two things that's the value you got for this mark and the range that it was in like the maximum mark so if it was lab it might have been five so you got four out of five right so something like that um int max um sorry mark the mark you got like the lab mark out of five and then the um the um uh maximum that you could have gotten right or you could call it out of if you want out of right like four out of five for example okay and then how do we calculate the redeem mark well it's going to be the maximum and luckily we've got these math libraries in java so math dot max and it's going to take the maximum of two numbers okay and we can say the mark it's going to be whichever is bigger either our mark or um, our exam divided by 100 divided by 100 times whatever the, the out of was okay so if we got 50% um, for our exam then um, and it was out of five then it'd be at the maximum of what have we got out of five or two and a half okay so it'll be um, uh, out of of times exam divided by 100 all right so that's how we redeem a mark. And then our final mark is going to be redeem assignment one out of five, right? Hopefully I'll get my math right here. Plus assignment two plus redeem continuous assessment out of five, CE five, because that's redeemable, right? I hope, I hope I'm getting this right here. Plus um, redeem a lab test, test that's out of five also. Five and uh, plus redeem the mid semester. Ooh, that's not what I wanted to do. 
redeem um, MSE, which I think is out of 10, uh, I hope. I might have that wrong. And finally, an exam plus an exam out of, out of, uh, out of, uh, we get half of the marks of the exam, right? So the exam and the, the exam is not redeemable. Notice that the assignment two is not redeemable and the exam is not redeemable. And we divide the exam by half because the exam is marked out of 100, but you get it's, it, it, it counts 50. So let's just add those up. So it's five plus five plus five plus 10 so that's 25 and the assignment 2 must be worth 25 I guess all right so there we are and then we can now what we can do is for our two string method we can say um, this person is a person and they um, with a great with a mark of um, and then we'll say um, mark okay what's the matter with that oh we need a plus sign we concatenate the two string we got from our parent with oops the two string from our parent with with the stuff here okay so there we are um and that should all be good and i've accidentally got this import that's when i made that typo earlier you got to get rid of these things if, they, if if intellij accidentally imports something like that it may cause problems when you run the ci so now let's go to inheritance now we're going to make fred be a student with all this stuff we're going to turn fred in from being a person to a comp 11 10 student comp 11 10 oops comp 11 10 student there it is and then age, their name, and their UID. Uh, U, uh, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like that. And then we've got um, all their marks. And what are all those things? Um, dang, I've already forgotten. Let's go back here and see what we, we get. Um, it's assignment one, assignment two, continuous assessment, blah, blah. Okay. Um, assignment one, so, so they got four out of five for that. Assignment two, so they got 20 out of uh, 25. Um, then they got three for that and two, f uh, say four for that. And then the last one's the final exam, is it? Um, imagine they got 65 for that, is that right? No, so mid-semester exams out of uh, 10. So let's just say they got uh, seven for the mid-semester exam. And then um, the final exam is out of, let's say they got 75 for the final exam. Okay, so there's Fred. And let's see what Mark Fred got. We run our test here, inheritance. And um, we've now created two people. Is it running? Yeah, there you go. Uh, and Fred got a mark of 75 in total. We changed this slightly. Let's just change that to 70. And you should see all the maths works itself out. So it won't be exactly 75, It'll be something else, it's 73. Okay, so that's that's calculating all that stuff we've got two people one thing to notice it's quite interesting but I've declared both these types to be person that's general but I've actually made them be quite specific this one's a student and this one's a comp 11 10 student last thing I'm going to do and I am over time I apologize for that is I'm going to do an enum type look I apologize for getting too slow I spent a little too long answering questions on the chat here it's taking me a while to get used to all this um, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly at this last part, which is an enum. You really want to know how enums work because they're in the assignment. Then I'm going to do the bio and then I'm going to say a few words about the uh, about the assignment. Okay, um, let me go here. So I'm going to create an enum. This is important. What we're going to do is going to create an enum for the grade. So file new, um, if you have to go, just please go. So I apologize for uh, going over time here. We're going to create an enum and its name is going to be grade, right? We're going to use a new grading system, grade. Um, like that and we add that to git and then we've got these different grades we have here hd d cr p and n that's the that's the standard a new grades we can just leave it like that now we've got five grades but we can do something much smarter than that we can allow the grade enum to be clever enough to do calculations for us to take to have a function that takes a mark and turns it into a grade and the way we're going to do that is going to parameterize these things by the lower bound on the mark for that type, right? So a D is 70, a credit is 60, a pass is 50, and a fail is zero, like that. And then what we'll do is we'll we'll we'll, we'll have we'll keep have a local variable which has this, it's actually a final variable, so private, because it can never change, int lower bound, lower bound like that. And then we, we need a constructor like that and it will take um, that lower like that and then we'll say um, this dot lower equals lower like that 
okay so now what that means is when we create one of these things it'll have that variable there it's set um, but it's set as a because it's final it means it won't change okay now we're going to write ourselves a special method that will convert from a number i.e a, 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 um, a mark into a grade okay so um, we'll write ourselves a public method public um, it's a static method and we'll say um, uh, grade we're going to return a grade and from a mark and we take an integer mark like this. And then what we'll do is we'll say for, we're gonna, a new, gonna go through all the different possible grades and find the first grade which satisfies this, that this mark falls within, okay? So um, uh, grade G from all the grades, so grade dot values, that's a list of all the grades we have, which is HDD, credit, pass, and fail. And we're gonna go through all those grades and we'll say we'll return if the mark is greater than or equal to the lower. So we start off and we, we, we return the first grade um, w where our mark is higher than or equal to the lower bound for that grade, okay? So we'll say, if mark is greater than or equal to um, G dot lower, that is the lower field of that grade, lower bound, then we'll return G. So we'll return that enum value. So we'll return D or return pass or return fail, okay? And if none of those match, we'll return fail, return n. Okay, now what we can do is we can finally go to our Comp 1110 student and say, date with a mark of that plus and a grade. And we can say grade dot from mark, mark. Okay, so that's going to take, going to, um, inside of our Comp 1110 students, going to calculate our mark again with this code here. Then it's going to go to the grade enum and figure out which grade it is and return um, the string for that. Okay, and enums have an automatic way of returning strings, strings, and that is the value. So it's going to be like HDD and so forth. That's the, that's the, um, that's how Java works by default, which is very convenient. So we don't actually have to write something. There we go. And so we see that uh, Fred got a distinction. All right. And that is the end of that lesson. Let me just quickly see if there's any uh, for immediate questions. The final keyword is similar to a constant. Yeah, so um, a final has two meanings. One is, it has one meaning, but it's used two different ways. So we have a final variable. It means like it's an instance field. It means this won't change after the instance is created. So each instance might have a different thing. So the color of the bike may always be, um, uh, I was always told it was bad practice to put multiple return statements in the code of which the common best practices do I have to follow? Um, yeah, uh, don't use an enum like a standard class. You do not want to have variable f values inside of an enum. Uh, that's a very important lesson. I can explain more detail later. And Lewis is asking about multiple return statements in the code. Where, why did you ask that question? What Was there a place where that was relevant? Oh, here, two return statements. No, that's totally, this. the, the way this code is structured is perfectly fine. Um, it is a question of taste, but that the, the, I think, Lewis, the answer to this is think about what the alternative is. I could write this code differently, but I think it'd be less clear if I wrote it a different way, right? So um, with things like that, which are style rules, they're, they're often defaults, um, like saying prefer this way of doing it or prefer that way of doing it. But I think the golden rule is that if it makes it more complicated, then don't do it. Okay, your intentions need to be clear. Now, let me quickly flip to our bio, then we'll talk about the assignment briefly, and then we'll stop. Okay, Grace Hopper, um, she's one of the champions of computer scientists, computer science. There's some great, there's some great YouTube video interviews with her, and um, uh, she uh, was one of the first people to write a, or to conceive the idea of a compiler. I mentioned to you in the last lecture that Zusa, uh, wrote a compiler for his uh, his computer. Uh, Grace Hopper was one of the first people to write uh, ones for the very first computer. She was an admiral in the US Navy, and she led to the development of one of the very first programming languages, which was COBOL. And uh, on a very amusing aside, she's uh, she's often credited as being the person who invented the the, the, the metaphor of a bug. And uh, this photograph here, oops. This photograph here is, uh, is, is the reference to it. So that's out of her logbook. And uh, they had electrical computers, uh, machines, and, uh, and uh, this moth was in there, and so she referred to it as a bug, and uh, and you see their first actual case of bug being found. Um, and someone says, uh, Harriet asked a good question. Let me just quickly go back to the code to answer that before I flip to other stuff. Where is it? 
uh, this dot lower bound equals lower bound where if you're inputting int lower bound where is it I don't see what you're referring to here we've got two lower bounds we've got the parameter lower bound and we've got the instance field so we say this dot lower bound to, to disambiguate these two different things that's the one that's being input that's the one that we're we're updating okay so we have to disambiguate this and this that um, that name and that name I need to disambiguate it and so this one here has got the this keyword notice IntelliJ changes the color to this kind of purpley bold and that means it's an instance field okay whereas that one's just in black which means it's a parameter okay hopefully I've answered your question anything else here um, all right now with that let's move on and go to the assignment very briefly I actually have a meeting in a few minutes actually I'm supposed to start the meeting now so I have run over time um, what I'm going to do because I'm I've got someone from overseas calling me right now. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop right here, but don't worry. I'm going to go over the assignment um, in a few minutes. Uh, once this meeting's finished, I won't live stream it. I'll record it. I'll tack it on the end of the recording, and that will be on the website, okay? So please um, have a look at that, and I will put a Piazza post with a link to the assignment. So unfortunately, I've run out of time to do it now. Besides, you guys shouldn't have to wait longer now, but I will um, say a few words about the assignment. I'll spend uh, 10 or 15 minutes later this afternoon after my meetings and I'll put them on the uh, website later today. So thank you for your time. Sorry I went over time. I guess I spent too long answering questions today, but hopefully that was helpful for you all. And if you have further questions, just let me know. And with that, we will finish up. Okay.